It is a national championship crossover here. Only one of these a year, fellas. And um, <laughs> we're the ones that get to record it. Uh, it's a big game on Monday night. And we got Steven Simcox from Locked On TCU. Obviously, I'm Daniel. He's Clint from Locked On Bulldogs. We're going to talk about this game. We're going to talk about this matchup. Uh, are there advantages? Are there disadvantages? Uh, and what do we see happening on Monday night in Southern California today on Locked On? So, Stephen, um, let's just jump right into it. Um, I would love to hear from a TCU uh, fan's perspective. Just give me a picture of this season, if you would, because it's been a wild one for you guys. Yeah, it sure has. Uh, and no better way to build credibility than to say I was like blatantly wrong about this team going into the season. Here we go. <laughs> uh, I, I predicted that they would go seven and five. And I thought that was almost. Um, yeah, almost. I thought that was like a pretty good, reasonable expectation. Um, they were five and seven last year. And, you know, sometimes a team goes like five and seven or four and eight. And you say, well, man, they were just like three or four plays away from being eight and four that was not the tc horn frogs <laughs> last season i mean they got they got blitzed by a few teams yeah um and ultimately like gary patterson for a long time was this program like you, sure. you thought of tc football he was the first person that came to mind he was kind of this larger than life figure uh people sort of rightly poke fun at the fact that there was a statue outside of the stadium of him and then kind of had to awkwardly say, Hey buddy, why don't you move on, <laughs> move on out of here and, and maybe do something else. Um, and that didn't end super gracefully, but Sonny Dykes comes over and, you know, I mean, he was like, he did a really good job at SMU. I would say post death penalty. He was certainly the best head coach that they've had, but his teams kind of had a reputation for starting quickly in the season and then sort of fading towards the end. It wasn't like he was playing for American conference championships year in and year out. I mean, SMU mm -hmm. was kind of like a, a team that would win eight to 10 games a year. So I thought, well, he can come in, he can improve the offense and that'll help them get to like bowl eligibility. Um, and it, it's been a little bit better than that. I would say they made it uh, to a bowl to your, they credit. made it to a bowl. They did. They make did. It to a bowl. Yep. I was, I was dead on about that. Um, you know, Max Duggan has like turned this thing around in a huge way. He had a really mm. rocky career up to this point, and he's sort of hit a, a completely different gear. They found a way to use these skill guys that they have um, and, and made them be successful. The defense has held up well enough. That they've gotten to this point, and yeah, I mean, they just kind of kept winning games. I think some things definitely fell into place for them. Um, you know, Oklahoma was going through a rebuilding year. Texas continues to uh, fall back and forth between being back and not back. And so there was, there, there was an open. Here's a, here's a hint. They'll be back to not very, very soon. Yeah. 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 They never it, were. It sort of goes up and then comes back down. It's, it's a nice little roller coaster, but um, they took advantage of a wide open big 12. And then, you know, they, they got in the dance and everybody thought they would uh, go quietly away and they decided not to do that. So they are, now in this place. So, I mean, I guess like from y'all's perspective, I know Georgia um, had high expectations. They, they won the national title last year, but this is in a lot of ways a different group than last season. So what has, has their journey kind of been like, even though they've been the top dog in a lot of ways all year long as they've, as they've defended this national title. Yeah. Kirby got a lot of, he took a lot of grief on Twitter from a lot of people because on, after the peach bowl, he, he, made some comment about how everybody's been doubting this team, yeah. which is a bit of hyperbole, obviously. Sure. They've been the number one team for quite some time, undefeated regular season, uh, defending national champions. But I think what he was alluding to is exactly what you just said, Stephen, which is that this is not the team that won the national championship. Mm -hmm. The team that won the national championship is playing for the Philadelphia Eagles and the Jacksonville Jaguars and, you know, all across the NFL. Those teams, those those players are competing for playoff spots, not national championships. And so um, it's a different Georgia team. It's a different feel around here. And the season has not always looked great. I mean, the Missouri game, everybody points to, was was a, a really tough night. 
for Clint and I, especially. Really, oh my gosh, don't want to relive that night. Really, every tough. moment. And Daniel's <laughs> birthday will forever be in, cemented in my wasn't, mind. Wasn't great, <laughs> um, uh, but the, the teams had its ups and downs. But I think, yeah, there's been there's been constant and steady expectations all year, and um, somehow, some way, this Georgia team's been able to live up to them thus far, and so. It definitely feels like they dodged this big bullet in the mm. semifinal and right. now step into the national championship game almost as weird as it sounds playing with free money. I kind of feel like both teams should be feeling that way. Like TCU was never expected to be here. They're kind of, mm. it's a free roll in the national championship for them. And Georgia should have been beaten in the semis. And so they kind of step into the national championship with a second life as well. I don't know, Clint, what do you think? Yeah, this the exciting wins that you talked about. And, and maybe I have a question off of this because as I watched TCU and I watched Georgia, the explosive big plays were the thing that salvaged the season for both these. Mm. It was Stetson in the fourth, and it was TCU's defense coming through with a couple of pick sixes as well as a couple of timely sacks. Uh, and so these these huge wins, I think one of the things that we have to keep in mind is, you know, coming off of that, uh, how you maintain a program. And it sounds like Sonny Dykes is the right dude because he's culture first guy. Mm -hmm. He's not a he's not a Lincoln Riley, which good thing for TCU. He's not this genius offensively. He's a culture guy. So set the culture. Right. You win everything else. It sounds that way. So I think. I think coming off of last week, uh, no one's going to be, you know, uh, anything but excited to say, no, we got another life here. Uh, that that win against Michigan, to me, um, seemed uh, very much advantageous or very much taking uh, taking advantage of opportunities. Is that TCU? Has that been the whole time from these comeback wins? Has they, have you been basically living on the edge? for this entire time waiting yeah. for the timely big plays to save a game? Or is that just what the national narrative is from the outside looking at a TCU? No, there's definitely some of that. I mean, I, I've spent a lot of the season talking about this offense needing to be more efficient and moving the chains more and sustaining long drives. And I think finally in the second half of that Michigan game, I just kind of gave up and said, okay, this is just who they are. Like they're just, they're just the team that gets like Quentin Johnston on a 75 yard touchdown catch or uh, Amar Di Mercado busts off a run. You know, they've, they've had, they waste possessions at times. They can be kind of frustrating with how they'll, they'll go two or three possessions in a row, maybe go three and out, maybe only pick up a couple first downs, but then they just kind of salvage it with big plays. Um, I think defensively they, they went through in the middle of the year, <laughs> It was like the second half was kind of their their key. Like they would feel they would sort of feel things out in the first half, and it seemed like once they got in the locker room, their defense coordinator Joe Gillespie was able to make some adjustments, and they came out with a new energy and were mm. um, were able to shut teams down. I, I think as the years gone on, they become more consistent. But uh, the Michigan game was fascinating because everyone just sort of thought, well, Michigan will just run all over them, and and that'll be the ball game. Uh, but they held up really well, like in the interior. And so it, it kind of got the Wolverines off their comfort zone and it became like, it became kind of like an old school big 12 shootout, which mm. was, which was funny to watch. And I think that's where they were most comfortable, even though they gave up 45 points mm -hmm. with the pick sixes that you mentioned um, and, and some of the stops inside the five, like it, it balanced out to at least, uh, you know, the perception that they, the defense played really well. So They've kind of done that all year. They've made big stops and big plays. I, I think um, they did it in the in the more that it happened during the season. They just have like a confidence about them now that they're 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 not really phased by much because they've kind of been through a lot of different situations. Um, you know, from Georgia's perspective, I, I know Ohio State like sort of had that defense on their heels um, early in that game. Was was this experience good for them. You guys mentioned the Mizzou game. I know um, there were a couple more this year. Kentucky was at least the score was close. I, I don't know like how you guys felt during that ball game. Yeah, that, that game was clinched from the second it started. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, that's, that's good to know, but was that a good, uh, this team, was that a good experience for them? I mean, is this going to work in Kirby's favor that he can sort of get after them this week and, and maybe hone in on some details since they escaped with that victory? 
Yeah, that's that's going to be interesting. I'm going to uh, do it. Uh, Adri, we're going to come back and answer that. But first, one want to know about Built Bar. Built Bar is the tastiest protein bar on planet Earth. And Daniel, do you have a Sam's Club membership, by the way, Daniel? I get out to the Sam's Club okay. sometimes. Well, if you do, guess who's going to be there in the aisle as you're going down? You Bilt tell Bar. me about Built Bar in bulk? A built Bar. Bulk Built in Bar? Bulk. 13 come packs on. of these things that are protein bars that taste like a candy bar. They're fantastic. Chocolate fruit flavors fudge it, it's incredible get over there builtbar.com tasty's protein bar on point earth high in fiber high in protein low in sugar low in fat they are meal replacement replace on the go uh before workout post workout during workout built bar the tastiest protein bar on planet earth uh we're talking to steven simcox and he just asked a question if this georgia team if kirby comes back from this game and has some motivation for it and uh yeah this this moniker that's been there and it actually probably goes more to point something kirby's been saying for some time is the ohio state game maybe showed georgia to buy into us he has this saying of they have to see us for 60 minutes the the gate is locked and it's 60 minutes of hell with us now that was certainly true with ohio state because again that fourth quarter sets in minute uh, becomes absolutely miracle maker during that time. And I think Stetson uh, knows and Kirby knows that at any point, the game is just going to, it's going to keep going. It's going to come down to key mm. points, just like the Rose bowl against Oklahoma, where Kirby goes for a field goal before half gets it. And that's what propels coming out of half. Uh, this game very much had the same thing, the peach bowl. We see uh, us get stopped uh, inside the 10 on a couple of stupid boneheaded plays and Kirby kicks the field goal. And we think we need that touchdown. What are you doing? And it only says, no, this game is 60 minutes. Watch out. So I, I think to your question, yeah, this is going to be right up Kirby's alley where he's going to use this to say, guys, um, don't ever quit on this. We, we got that dog in us and no games out of reach. Keep clawing and scratching and fighting and the better team will always come out. I think that's very much indicative of his his mentality. Daniel, you, you agree? Yeah, I don't think it's mu as much like a let's light a fire because we played poorly. I mean, because, Stephen, it, it's a great point, and that will happen, but Kirby does that every week. You know, if we won by 50, Kirby would still be out there. That's just his mentality. Okay, yeah. You know, he's Every that. game sucks, according to Every Kirby. game's right. terrible. You know, he comes from that Nick Saban tree where it's just like you're never satisfied with anything. You're mm. never happy about anything. He loves to coach. He loves to critique. He loves to, you know, kind of get on guys. And so that's what he's going to do anyway. I do think, to Clint's point, this game just sort of solidifies the mentality that George is going to have. There will never be a point in this game no matter the score, that Georgia doesn't think they're going to win the game. Mm. And I honestly believe that's the same for TCU. Steven, you can only speak to that. But TCU's been through so much, at least from an outside perspective. They've had so many come-from-behind wins. Max Duggan has been so clutch, even in the game they lost, uh, that I feel like both of these teams are going to feel like they're never out of it. Um, because of the nature of how they have played up to this point. And so I think both teams are going to feel like they are in the game no matter what. I'd love to ask you, Stephen, about... I wasn't on the pod yesterday, but Clint was, and we talked to um, somebody from... Uh, twenty four seven. Were they Colin Post over at twenty four seven? Oh, yeah, yeah, over, yeah. He, yeah, he had some very guy. very interesting things to say about this uh, TCU defense and offense. And, and um, I'll just tell you what he said and see if you agree. Uh, this defense, he says, this three three five has some guys that love to hit at the linebacker position. Very physical, <laughs> love to bang. But he's a little concerned because Brock Bowers ain't your typical Big Twelve <laughs> tight end, and he likes to bang, but. He likes to go 4 5 40 or 4 4 40 over the top, and mm -hmm. you can't tackle that. It's called pass interference. Is that going to be a big problem for this TCU defense? Uh, in short, yes. I'll, I'll give a <laughs> I'll give a more complete answer. So um, Colin's right. Jamoy Hodge and Johnny Hodges, they're two inside linebackers. Like I think these guys should be required to wear a neck roll because they they play like they're in the nineties. I mean, they're I love just, those dudes. Yeah, uh, old those, school, yes, big, them. like, I, honestly, I think the first, it, it's funny, as, as I was rewatching the Michigan game, the, the first big run that Donovan Edwards broke off, and I'll, I'll give a uh, 
a uh, hat tip to Parker, who his, he goes by Stats of War on Twitter. I don't know if you guys yep. follow him, but he's got so some we, really good. He, he was the one that connected us to with, with over at our boy with yeah with Colin. Yeah, yeah it's a, it's a small world in TCU media, so that 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 makes sense. But um, he he posted like a clip where it looks like the bust on that play was basically Jamoy Hodge was so excited to just crack somebody's skull on the first play. Yes, that he ran into the fullback and knocked him back a couple yards and it like messed up his run fit. And so Donovan just ran right past him and then got to the second level, but it wasn't because he was like not trying to, you know, get to the line of scrimmage. So both those guys are, are really physical. D winters is a more athletic player. He had a really good game uh, in the national tie, excuse me, in the national semifinal, he had the pick six um, mm-hmm. in the second half, but they don't really, the, the linebackers and safeties are the guys to pick on in coverage because they're two corners um, Trey Hodges, Tomlinson, and Josh Newton have been really good this year, and so yeah, I am scared of uh, Brock Bowers. I don't know, you know, I'm, I know there's still some uncertainty about Darnell Washington's status for this well, game. He's, he's fine. No, he's fine. We, okay. we're just telling ourselves he's fine. He's, <laughs> just join us in, in speaking like it into existence. He's fine. Oh, okay, I'll speak that over Kendra Miller too, and we can yeah, just, like, yeah. just in our own delusions tonight. I'm, fine. I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that. <laughs> but uh, both those players are are super talented, and that's uh, obviously that's an understatement. But you know, one thing that probably is true if if you're going to knock the Big Twelve is that they don't have like I can't really think of anybody that they've played this year that is a a true you know dual threat as a tight end who's going to come out and catch mm-hmm. the ball and then get yards after the catch. And so these, uh, you know, their linebackers and safeties, that's going to be a problem. And, and I don't know how Joe Gillespie adjusts to that. I mean, I'm not sure if he maybe cheats those corners over at times, but both those guys are kind of smaller. So I, I can't imagine they're going to match up with Bowers. Um, it's just something they're honestly probably going to have to live with and, and hope that it's not as glaring of an issue as, as it seems to be um, on paper. But they're certainly a matchup problem. I, I guess we can turn to – so the – the, the struggles in, in past defense that Georgia had against Ohio State, is, is there a blueprint there? Was this just, you know, a, a, a bad game? Or what's kind of been wh- – what did LSU and Ohio State do well that allowed them to score more points on Georgia than, than they've typically given up, you know, throughout yeah. the season? Well, just – I'll separate those two games first. Just if you were casually watching them or, or reading the box score, they may have looked similar. LSU obviously put up a lot of yards. But but that game was was sort of a different animal. It was garbage mm-hmm. time basically from the second quarter on. Georgia just came out so sure. fast, and there was never a chance that LSU was – the Ohio State game, totally different feel, totally different game, totally different scheme. So I think if you look at that game, what, what really hurt Georgia – was that they couldn't get C.J. Stroud on the ground, if we're going to just be totally honest. Now, Clint and I have had issues with some of the past um, coverage issue, you know, situations for Georgia over the course of the season. There are some guys, you know, you mentioned the safeties for TCU is is, is where you go to, to find – um, to find open space and and there are, there are some of those guys on Georgia's team as well from our perspective. But but really, if we're going to be fair, the issues against Ohio State really stemmed from uh, C.J. Stroud's ability to get away, which is not his game. It is not he's not right. an elusive quarterback. He's a he's a stand in the pocket kind of guy. He's a good athlete, obviously, but he's a stand in the pocket kind of guy and throw it around. And and Georgia's got really fast really big, really physical front seven, and they were getting there. They were mm-hmm. there consistently in that game. Um, there are not many offensive lines in college football that are going to be able to keep Georgia out of the backfield. Georgia is going to be able to get pressure and cause havoc in the backfield because they have guys like Jalen Carter who, quite frankly, just cannot be blocked. So the issue against Ohio State was that C.J. Stroud was eluding that pressure. He was scrambling around five, six, seven second plays, and guys were getting lost and getting over the top on the back end. A lot of the concern, I think, for Georgia going into this game will be: Can you get is can you keep can you get your hands on Max Duggan and can you get him on the ground when you get your hands on him? Can you keep him from because Max Duggan, quite frankly, more athletic than C.J. Stroud. Um, yeah. probably more elusive in the pocket than C.J. Stroud. And TCU, from my perspective, you could speak to this, but TCU, from my perspective, we talked about earlier in the week, they love to stretch that play out and go deep. They love to swing for the fences. You mentioned the inefficiency at times of their offense. 
you know, and we noticed that same thing as well. Not a lot. Sometimes they're in third and long quite a bit, mm-hmm. but sometimes they don't care about being in third and long because, you know, when you get 65 yards on the third down play, it doesn't matter, <laughs> you know, what the down and distance was. So it, it really will be a uh, interesting to see, and I think we'll know kind of early on, is Georgia going to not just get pressure but get home? Because mm-hmm. nobody likes the matchup with Quentin Johnson on the back end. Nobody no. likes the match. Like, no. Nobody. There's no team in America that's like, yeah, I think we can cover Quentin Johnson for five seconds. Nobody mm-hmm. thinks that. And so, as you mentioned with Brock Bowers, it Georgia will have to find different ways to keep, number one, from ruining the game for them. And the most effective way of doing that is – get a lot of consistent pressure on Max Duggan and get him on the ground. And I'm, I'm interested to see how they do that. And, and I'll throw this back to you real quick. Like, are, are they a team? They typically don't blitz a ton, right? Or is that, is that their MO? Is it, is it sort of a mix? They, they like to get pressure using the front four and, and we have a couple of edge guys that we rotate in pressure is going to come in different packages from the star mm-hmm. position and the inside backers. So really three guys, JDJ, Dumas Johnson, <clears throat> Ryan Davis, and then Bullard off the edge. And every once in a while we'll bring a you know a cat blitz, something like that. But typically they're going to try to man up and uh, get home with the four guys and, and maybe bring a fifth every so often. Uh, exotic blitz packages aren't our thing. We just kind of line up and say we're going to beat you with our speed and size. But they do bring guys. I mean, it's, yeah. it's consistently yeah. four, five, sometimes six guys they'll bring – you're not going to see a bunch of like zero blitzes mm, from no. Georgia, but you are also going to see Kirby say, we'll leave our guys in man and mm-hmm. we will send a, a linebacker, you know, or we'll send a, a, you know, a slot corner. We'll send a slot corner on the blitz and roll a safety down. You will see that from Georgia quite a bit. And they gave, you know, they've, They've had success doing that um, this year. They had success against Tennessee doing that. Javon Bullard, you know, did make a few plays against Ohio State doing that as well. And so I do think if they feel like they're not getting pressure or the pressure's not working, I do think Kirby believes in it and you will see whatever it takes. You know, the last time Georgia didn't send consistent pressure in a game, was last year's SEC championship game against Alabama. And we know how that game ended for Georgia. And I think since then, we've seen Kirby kind of learn his lesson and say, we cannot let a good quarterback, which Georgia's faced several good quarterbacks this year, Hendon Hooker, a good quarterback, CJ Stroud, a good quarterback, Max Duggan, another good quarterback. We cannot let a good quarterback stand back there uh, because he will, he will beat us. And so... Uh, if the front four aren't getting home, you will see other guys start to come. And if TCU can withstand that, that will open up things for them in the passing game because it'll be it, you know it'll lead to more one on one matchups or whatever. Yeah, the the intriguing thing about that dynamic to me is about midway through the season, uh, Big Twelve teams just started saying we're just going to heat max up. Like that was kind of mm. the the blueprint to get him uncomfortable and. This O line for TCU, like they're they're big and they're physical. Uh, they struggle sometimes moving their feet and dropping their hips and, and with athletic edge guys, which I know Georgia has. So that'll be a key to the game. Uh, but that's kind of like the the frequent blitzing has kind of magnified the idea that their offense is sometimes just like screw it, Quentin's down there somewhere. Like let's just <laughs> let's just throw it up and and hope yep. for the best. And if we, if we hit three or four of these in a game, then then it's worth it. And I mean, for the most part, they've they've been right about that. Um, but yeah, they they want like they they welcome that to a certain extent because hmm. you can get some big plays off of it. But at the same time, if you're not able to protect and um, if you're taking negative plays, then you're off schedule and then your defense can be on the field for for a long time. So that is that is kind of an interesting. Um, situation with this game i want to ask you guys too about so stetson bennett i mean i know the, the qbs they always there's always a lot of scrutiny um have we finally reached the point where we can stop like like calling are people 
finally not calling him a bus driver anymore? Yeah. I mean, have we, yeah. have we gotten past the narrative a little bit? Okay. Well, so some it's people, uh-huh. some people are still doing that. Sure. sure. Some people will say dumb things for the rest of their life, Stephen. You just can't, you can't, you can't change those, those types of things. I don't know if you know, people are dumb. People tend to be fairly dumb. But Stetson Bennett is the best Georgia quarterback of all time. And there's little no to question. no debate about mm. that. And um, if he's able to win this game, there will be very little debate about his place in college football history, I think. You know, you're talking sure. about now a back to back national champion and potentially if he's able to play well and win this game, a back to back offensive MVP of the championship. You know, like those types of things don't happen very often. And so, yes, Stetson Bennett has endured an incredible amount of scrutiny. And I almost think, you know, the the national narrative and the whatever, and I get there's going to be a lot of casual college football fans that are watching this game. And it's going to be interesting to them that he's a former junior college transfer. He's a former walk-on, you know, that you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But I almost think that how good of a story Stetson Bennett is is hurting his legacy at this point. I think it it because he's transcended that story and he's now much more than a good story. He's a good football player. And he's a football player that marched Georgia down the field down six in the national semifinal with two and a half minutes to go on the clock and scored a touchdown almost entirely on his own. And so those types of moments and those types of things are bigger than just um, a fun 30 for 30 documentary. That's just, that's, that's like legendary football player type stuff. And so, yes, we're, we're big Stetson Bennett fans. And I think it's funny, you know, like, I mean, there's so many similarities just in these two teams, which you would never preseason. You'd never be like, who, which two teams are a lot alike? Uh, TCU and Georgia. Those are two teams that are a lot alike. But there are so many similarities between these two teams. And I think you mentioned earlier, Max Duggan. It's not like it's been sunshine and rainbows for this kid, Mm-mm. like his entire career. It's not like all TCU fans have been like, yes, you know what I need more of? Max Duggan. You know what would be awesome is if Max Duggan played more football for TCU. And yet here he is, Heisman finalist, and leading him to the national championship, a place you know that they would have never dreamed they could go. And so, yeah, I think the similarities just keep coming out. Um, it's a fascinating matchup. Yeah, it really is. These these two quarterbacks love their stories, love their grit. And and that's the you love the stories, love their grit. But then you say, OK, that'd be fun. However, they're talented. They're uber talented. That's right. the thing that I think people are missing on this. Um, Stephen, last question for you. How does this game turn ideal for TCU? Like if you had the keys to write a script, Ooh. how would you write this game for TCU to have the best chance of winning? Well, I mean, I think uh, you need some early mistakes by Georgia. I know Stetson Bennett had like an ill-advised pick in that first half against Ohio State. Um, that would be pretty pretty awesome if yeah. he would do that. Get if he bucket, would do that Daniel. again. Get the bucket. Let me, <laughs> let me reach for a bucket here real quick. Yeah. You, you keep talking. You're fine. Um, so if, if you can turn him over, that would be uh, ideal. I, I feel like this offense – just getting off to a quick start again. You know, I don't I don't imagine that. I think it, it's hard to gauge these things. I remember hearing the, some of the Michigan players and their comments during the week, and there were people on the ground there that were saying, I, I don't know if, like, I don't know if Michigan really feels like this is going to be much of a test for them. And I do believe that they got caught in a dogfight and they weren't expecting it. Mm. Um, I'm not expecting that from Georgia. I just – I. I, I think between what happened last week and, you know, Kirby's kind of obsessiveness and his similarities to Nick Saban, I, I imagine their heads are going to be on straight. But um, if you can get out to a quick lead and sort of dictate the pace of this game, I know Georgia is not going to be completely uncomfortable in a shootout. Like that's not going to be a foreign thing to them. But if it's back and forth and if it's crazy – um, I feel like that ultimately benefits TCU because maybe there's a weird bounce or an odd play that goes their way. And I think in the end, um, if Max Duggan has the ball with a chance to go win it late in mm. the fourth quarter, mm. you really can't ask for a better situation. Yeah. If you're a TCU fan, 
Um, and I would believe that he could get it done in that, in that, you know, moment because he's done it all year long. And yeah, because just, why wouldn't you? Yeah, exactly. You know, that's, that's how the, that's how the Disney movie ends, right? You go down and, and something happens and, and they win the football game. So, uh, you know, I think that's the, the ideal scenario for TCU is they're able to get out to an early lead, stay in the game, and then, you know, make some plays late to win it. Um, how does this go for, for Georgia, for them to complete the perfect season? What's the script for this team to, to come out unscathed and, and with another national title? I think there, I think there are maybe a, a couple scenarios that I could see playing out. I think in, in an ideal world, Georgia is able to Georgia has been a very fast starting team this year. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, typically they have been a very fast starting team and they've been a very fast starting team defensively. It was what was so crushing about that Ohio state game. Honestly, Georgia came out and got a three and out on their very, or not a three and out. They got one first down, but then Georgia was able to get off the field, get a punt on Ohio state's first possession of the game. And then Georgia marched down the field and looked really good doing it. Like, really crisp. Stetson was hitting hitting receivers. And then the drive stalls out, and they miss a field goal to keep it 0-0. And Ohio State comes down the field, scores a touchdown, and it feels like Georgia blew its chance to kind of establish the tone early. But that's been their M.O. really when they've been successful. Kirby's made some really good – Kirby's a good halftime coach. And I know Sonny Dykes is too, and this TCU team, and to your point, has been a great second-half team. Both these teams are good second-half teams. And so I think for Georgia, if they're able to come out and start fast, similar to what you said, because then I think Georgia's, Georgia's really able to lean on you in the run game. They have a very physical offensive line. I know Michigan thinks they have a really physical offensive line, but Georgia has a really physical offensive line. And... Um, when Georgia starts leaning on you in the run game, you you become because of the style of play of Georgia and the the types of guys who are their primary weapons. If that makes sense, when mm -hmm. Georgia is leaning on you in the run game, um, you become incredibly susceptible to getting gashed by them because. Brock Bowers and Darnell Washington are in on every run play. They're two of the best blockers on Georgia's team. And when you get used to them blocking you over and over again, and then they run by you down the seam, like that's where Georgia really can open things up and, and get after it. And so I think Georgia doesn't, you know, Georgia, Georgia has not done well in terms of creating a bunch of big momentum plays this season. We've talked about that. They haven't created a ton of turnovers. They have a negative turnover margin for the season, but, but they're just this grinded out type of team that believes that in the fourth quarter, they'll be better than you. Now in an ideal world, Georgia fans won't have to wait till the fourth quarter to know that they're going to win this game because good Lord, I cannot handle that anymore. Like I just don't want it. I don't need it in my life. And so in an ideal world, Georgia's up 75 to nothing in the first quarter. And then that's all that's, that's the, that's the end of the game. All right. Well, Daniel's reached the delusional part of the week. I'm so glad it got out here so quick. Um, we made it. We made it. I, I've been saying all week, I want the most boring game in the entire world. I want mm. Georgia to run for 350 yards. Exactly what you said, TCU, that shootout, that excitement, the ball bouncing. I want none of it. I want to line up in I formation and ro <laughs> run ISO 75 times. That's what I want because I think that I think we win in that case. Now, that's not going to happen because, as Todd Munkin has said, he throws to set up the, the, the run. That's how Georgia's offense goes. Those gashes that Daniel's talking about come because the linebackers are, are getting a little – you know, their hips are turned a little early. They're not flying right. downhill because they're worried about getting beat over the top uh, on the seam route or on the dig route. And so um, I think the best way that Georgia wins is keeping a balanced attack and not if they limit the turnovers. And if we take care of Big Will Johnson on the outside, I don't know if TCU's other receivers can keep up with our lesser guys. I, I'm very nervous about Keely Ringo. That's one of the spots you asked earlier. Um, I, I think he's susceptible to getting hit on the big home run. Uh, but for, for Georgia fans, we are wanting Kenny Mack, Kendall Milton, and Dejon Edwards to get 60 carries, uh, and, and that would be just fantastic. Now, that's not going to happen, 
because again, as you said, that's not how the Disney movie ends. It ends with Stetson and, and Max having a slug fest. And um, <laughs> I'm already, already vomit like with that situation. Mm. I don't want that. It's not great. Yeah. I mean, honestly, they've TCU's had so many close games. I would feel weird if they didn't. I mean, I would, I would also love a blowout for in TCU's favor, but I just think this team's not, not really capable of it. They're addicted to playing close games. So I'm, oh. I'm excited for it. Great. So I will have the EMTs on standby <laughs> at Daniel yeah. house. It's not just, it's, you know, if it's your time, it's your time, Clint. Just That's let right. it happen. It's fine. <laughs> it's all good. Peace and peace. I'm out. Um, uh, Steven, it was a lot of fun. Um, enjoyed it. Um, congratulations to TCU on an incredible season. Congratulations to Georgia on an incredible season. It's been fun um covering these teams all the way to the national championship and i know steven will be back you'll have an episode drop monday right you'll probably you'll you'll be out monday we will we'll be uh live on monday doing you yep. know some pregame coverage and uh yeah excited yep. about it huge huge moment for this program so we're gonna we're gonna cover it the best we can on locked on horn frogs yeah so you know check that out if you're a georgia fan you want a little uh, opposition perspective check out that locked on horn frogs podcast clint and i will also be back on monday morning for a little pregame um uh, show and then we'll be back on monday night for go. a postgame recap as well so double episode on monday um just don't judge us based on how we look Monday night because it's going to be a long day and you, just, you never know what, what will have happened. But uh, Locked On Bulldogs, Locked On Horn Frogs, the place to be for all of the coverage leading up to the national championship game, and we will see you guys there.